All right, so we've already accomplished how to find the volumes of these solids which have been rotated around an axis. We, we said basically that if we rotate a solid around an axis, the cross section is going to be a circle. If we add up all those circles, in other words, disks, then we're going to get the volume of that figure. Does that make sense to you? So to add up the surface area of all these disks, this infinite number of disks, you're going to get a volume out of it. The idea of volumes by washer stems from this problem. What would happen, say, if I had my famous function called f of x from a to b. Now, here's where we started. Okay, this is what we were just talking about. If you sweep this around the x-axis, it will create a volume. I mean, it will create a solid, and we will be able to find the volume by taking slices of with our, our disks. That, that's true. However, what happens if there's another function between f and the x-axis, namely, let's call it g of x. What if I swept that thing around, rotated about the x-axis, it's also going to create some sort of a solid. Do you see it? Only the solid's going to have a hole in the middle. This is actually the idea of a vase. Right? The other one, it looked like a vase, but it was a solid vase. It'd be like a vase out of concrete. You couldn't put flowers in it. This one would really have, be a vase. If I sweep this around, it's going to be like taking this piece and rotating out. There's going to be a hole in the middle, kind of like a, a toilet paper roll, almost like that, but it's going to be a fancy shaped toilet paper roll. I mean, that'd be kind of cool, but that's what it would, similar, that's what it would be like. Let's see if I can draw it for you so you get a three dimensional picture. This might be hard for some of you to draw. Do you get the picture, at least the idea of what I'm trying to portray here? Does it look, can you see that that's the rotation? If I rotate that out, what it makes is some outer surface, yes, and then some inner surface where the, the inside of the inner surface is actually hollow. Let's think about what's going on here. First thing that I want to talk about, is the cross section still a circle? Circular in nature. still circular in nature. If I take a cross section, bam. But let's think about this for a second. If I think about it, well, if it's circular in nature, then, then this should work for us. The volume should still be some integral from A to B. It should be some integral from A to B. How we did the volume of any solid is we integrated the surface area of our cross section, remember that? We took the surface area of our cross section. We integrated the surface area of our cross section from A to B. That was basically it. So we still have this idea. Integrate from A to B. The function A of X dx, where A of X is the area of the cross section. That seems pretty easy. Now all we got to do is find out how much is the area of the cross section. <coughs> well, let's think about it for a second. Area of the cross section. Well, that should be. Think about. Think about the cross section here. What's the bigger 
disc. Do you see the two discs that we're going to get out of this? We're getting a disc made by f of x, and inside we're getting a disc made by g of x. What's the bigger one? So what if we did this? What if we took the area of the cross section of f of x and subtracted the area of the cross section of g of x? Would you agree that that's going to give us the surface area of the cross section of the, the piece that's actually filled in? I'll, I'll try to explain it with the picture again. The area of f of x, remember that this is f of x, this outside one. And this is g of x, this inside one. So if I take the area of the cross section of f of x, and I take the area of the cross section at g of x, and I subtract them, I, basically what I'm taking is a, a big disk from f of x minus a small disk from g of x, and it's going to give me the region that the difference between those, those circles, basically. And that's going to be the area between f of x and g of x. We're going to have to understand that. You're okay with it? Okay, cool. Well, so let's think about what that means then. Oh, how do you find area of a circle? Pi r squared. Pi r squared. <clears throat> pi r squared. So if area is pi r squared for a circle, can you tell me what our r is? Here? The r is for my f of x, my outside one. Okay, I'll, I'll give you, it's going to be y. It's going to be y at the value x, wherever x happens to be. What is y wherever x happens to be? f of x. Whatever f of x is the function, right? So how do you find out the height right at this point? Ah, well, you just take your function. The function's value at that point. Remember, f of x says the function's height at the point x. Are you with me on that? So wherever I'm at, I'm given the height by just plugging in x to f of x. That will be the function f of x. So the height here is f of x. That means the radius is f of x. What's the height here? So here's basically all we said. I'm going to try to recap this for you so you understand where the formula is coming from. We take this figure that's created by f of x minus g of x. That, that, that's basically the area. We're going to sweep that area around the x axis. It's going to create some sort of a toilet paper roll. Uh, that, that's the idea. A fancy one because it's not uniform in shape. It's not rectangular, but that's the idea here. So we, we sweep that out. We have this volume. It's solid, but it has a hole in the middle of it. What we're thinking is if we can find the cross-sectional area, then we can integrate. If we can find the cross-sectional area, we can integrate across our, notice how we still have perpendicular sides, perpendicular to the x-axis. We needed that. Remember for the disks, you need to be able to get actual disks. So we had to have those that work still. So this is still true. We're integrating all those disks, adding them all up, adding them up from A to B of the <coughs> function A, A of x. That's all the surface areas of those disks. No problem whatsoever. We just got to find the surface area of the disk. The surface area of the disk of the, well, I should say washer in this case because we're going to make that transition, of the washer is the f of x circle minus the g of x circle. That's, that's what we're talking about here, the area of the f of x minus the area of the g of x. Well, we know area is pi r squared. Our r in any case of these cross sections is f of x or g of x respectively. So radius of our circle of our cross section, that's just the height of the function. Let's write f of x. It's just the height of the function. It just says g of x. So if we put, put in these areas, we should get pi r squared minus pi r squared. Hopefully you're seeing where these things are coming from. I, I'd love for you to understand why these formulas actually work. What are, we, what are we really doing? What's this stand for? No, this whole thing. Oh, the area, area for the first function. Good. What are the outside <coughs> ones? The top, we'll say the top one in this case. The top one, that's the radius. The height of the function is the radius. Square it times it by pi, you get an area. This is the inside. second inside, whatever you want to call it. The g of x in this case. Radius squared times pi, that's the area. Area of the large disk minus area of the small disk gives us the area of a washer, the surface area of a washer. 
Uh, if we want to be a little bit fancier about this, we'll probably just factor out the pi. Just factor the pi out. And then what that says is we actually have the expression for a of x that we're looking for. We're going to do the volume is an integral from a to b, sure. Pi is going to be there. We're just going to integrate the surface area of a washer from a to b. That right, here, right there is called the volume by washers. That's what we just found. Would you like to do an example? Okay. I was hoping so. Otherwise, the lesson would stall out and be like, okay, so what do we do now? Party time. No, not so much. Okay, that's very wordy, but I wanted to make sure you understand exactly what we're doing. This is what we're doing. <coughs> we're trying to find the volume of the solvents created when the area between two functions, f of x and g of x in this case, between the interval, uh, on the interval 0 to 2, is rotated around the x-axis. That's the whole idea. Now, we should be able to set this thing up and find the volume of that. Uh, you're subtracting the two functions, so there's a possible that you can compose them. Like, can you, like, go f of... It's not a composition, no. You can't do that. You might be able to, but it's not going to give us the volume that we're looking for. Okay, now, oh, what's important for us to know before we start this problem? Say it again. Why would that be important? Yeah. If you subtract them incorrectly, you are not going to get the right answer. You're going to get some sort of negative volume. Can things have a negative volume? No. It's crazy to think about, but no. You can't have a negative volume. Well, maybe the opposite of complete well, vacuum, I suppose. But that's not even black hole. It still has something. In fact, it has a lot of mass, actually. Uh, the center of black hole. So, no, we can't have negative volume. Uh, what we could have is positive volume, but we need to make sure we set it 